All right, everyone. So we are live. We're being streamed on our Mindful Men's Club page and be sure to share it across our reroute and mental wealth as well. So just going to give it a minute or so for some people to join. But I think personally from the conversations that we've had in the private Zoom meeting earlier and the conversation that we've had just before we've come online, I think this is, um, this is going to be a fascinating conversation talking about the trends, the patterns and just what people are aware of, of, of what domestic violence is and, and how it plays out on um, for both male and female as well. But before we do, um, I just wanted to say hello to everyone that's joining us live. Uh, we're just going to introduce everyone shortly through as well. And just feel free to, to comment in the chat on Facebook. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. And please do share your questions as well, because this is going to be a very, very interactive conversation. Um, so I'm just going to go through the Zoom room on my right and, and invite everyone to, to introduce themselves. So firstly, Manoj, over to you. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Manoj from Mindful Men's Club. Uh, I'll just keep it short. <laughs> a lot of people know me already on that. And um, yeah, over, over to um, the rest. My name's Anisha. Um, I uh, volunteer for Reroot, which is a mental health uh, support group for South Asian women. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Nadia, and I am also part of Reroot as a co-organiser and co-facilitator. Hey, um, I also work with Nadia and Nisha, and uh, I'm at Reroot as a peer worker. Hi, I'm Madhu, and I work for Mental Wealth, where I'm a volunteer and co-founder of that, where we call facilitate and organise events. Thank you guys and, and I'm Viraj um, along with Manoj, I'm one of the co-founders in the Mindful Men's Club and help facilitate those meetings as, as well as just some of the conversations we have on, on social media. Um, so let's uh, let's kick off on this subject. So um, I want to invite firstly um, Madhu to share with us why are we talking about this particular subject and, and what resonance does it have for, for people that, that are listening um, to this and, and what, what, can, what can they expect from us? Um, well, I've, I just feel that the, for me, I think I, for mental wealth, I think we would like people to be aware that, um, that there should be support for everybody, no matter what they're going through. Um, it's a bit of a difficult one. It's just that I feel very passionate about this, the fact that people can remain quiet and um, get abused and feel that there's no help for them. And having an open conversation, I believe, um, by doing this today would actually maybe give them a bit of strength or realization of what, you know, what they can do, how they can actually get help. So that's what I'm hoping that um, they can actually get from this conversation today. Amazing. And Anisha, I'm inviting you as well from, from Riru. Um, what, uh, what is your intention for today and takeaways for the people that are watching? So sort of to echo what Madhu said, just to kind of raise awareness of domestic abuse. Um, and I don't know an awful lot on the subject, but it is still quite prevalent. And so I think it's just really important to, you know, highlight the red flags and, you know, why it happens um, and sort of the impact it can have on people suffering from it. And also just to kind of raise awareness of what Reboot do um, and that we provide an open platform for support for people. Um, to have like kind of open discussions about it and sort of lean on one another. Um, so yeah, just those two really are the main main things. Awesome. Um, and Manoj, over to you. We just had our uh, private Zoom meeting with with some of our regulars on on this same topic as well. Um, what were some of the key takeaways that that came out from from that, and the ones that stood out for you personally too? Yeah, sure. I think um, so. So first of all, the subject um, wasn't our subject, and um, just just to let the audience know, it was um, um, put forward um, by one of the actual men um, from Mindful Men's Club, and it's it's a very deep subject, and it's a subject just to echo everyone else's um, messages and voices is that it's just raising awareness, uh, which is absolutely key, and it's to share with everyone that it's okay to call it out um in, in in the safe way that you feel that you can call it out and it's okay to share and and, and i guess where and we will do a lot of signposting throughout this conversation i'm sure in terms of the different places that you can go to 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 actually um help whether you're a victim or if you're an abuser 
etc or if you're in that hero um, um role as well right because we we discussed that they can interject and, and and switch between the two i think the key thing for me was um language was a big one uh, so a big realization is the language that we use leaves a really powerful footprint on people around us and yeah, one of the things that we talked about quite often uh, men will say i don't say this anymore but i used to hands up say this um and, and i think it, it's said quite often in football matches as well where a, ma a man would say man up to, to another man but me knowing the impact that that language can have and the subtlety and the shift between when it stops becoming banter and when someone can actually be going through something impactful that we have no idea of. So I've made a personal choice not to use that phrase because I can't possibly know. I don't have an invisible window to see what's happening in each other uh, person's life around me. So I stopped using that. So that was a realization for me. So I think for me, I mean, there were so many, I've got loads of notes, but we'll, we'll come through it. But language was a massive one. And the language that we use and the intention behind the language um, is really, really powerful because to friends, even among, I would love to get a female perspective, but I'm sure, but definitely from a male perspective, uh, banter is used quite a lot, very loosely, very, very loosely. But there's always someone who's actually a victim of that banter, but they're afraid to say it, call it out within that circle, because they might have their friends amplify that language even more and say, well, what do you mean? Well, well, stop being so sensitive or you know or man up so i think for me language is, is, is probably a, a great place to start so i just realized i was on mute that's right <laughs> being on lockdown you'd figure this mute button out um <laughs> yeah I, I i agree i i feel that from the key takeaway from the, from that call was, was one of those things when someone is in a position where they want to share about okay here's something that they're at the effect of it's almost laughed off and said come on you're a bloke you mm -hmm. shouldn't have to worry about that whereas actually it could be a sign that something's going on as well and it's just being just being very attuned to yes you can have a laugh with people but then also when you get the message back about no this is serious you just take that step back and and check in and see what's going on um yeah nadia over to you um what uh, what would you like to to add to that and and your perspectives too um yeah so like manager saying about um, language, I think absolutely like language is a really important thing that plays a role in um, in like stigmatizing um, just speaking out about um, your like emotions and mental health. So when something's going on, um, it's it you have to be very sensitive with the the kind of stuff you're talking about around friends because you have no idea like the impact your words can have on um, someone um, and they may even uh, trigger them or it may cause them to shut down even more so. So um, just to, to, to like add to that, I would say that um, I think with the whole idea of like masculinity and just always being strong, it can, can take a toll um, just always like trying to be brave and like trying to act like nothing affects you and I've seen it because I, I have an older brother as well so I've seen it with him and um, how it can impact him around his friends and um, so yeah so I think um, there's just that a, a lot of like that um, I can't think of the right word for it but I guess just the pressure to be okay when you're not. Definitely and and let, let's, um, I'm just looking at the chat, see if we've got any questions here. Um, we've got a comment here from Yuvraj that uh, I believe abuse comes from the place of complex is inferior and superior. A person who regards itself themselves as superior has the authority over the inferior person. Um, and comment here from Son, completely agree about the language point. It's already hard enough to speak about the issues that trouble us. This could push someone into their shell. Um, great comments there, guys, and please do keep them coming. Um, so I think if we look at, say, the pattern of, of abuse, um, there is that hierarchy. There's someone that wants to assert something or take control over something and, and coming from potentially a place of, of disempowerment because, as, as they say, hurt people hurt people, and there's the, a natural sort of pass on for that. There's a disempowerment that they're experiencing and that's being expressed there. Um, Amanda, I, I want to hand over to you on, on, on that and... and 
I invite you to take it from there. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, it's you on mute, I know, <laughs> sorry. Um, I just wanted to talk about the language thing as to talking about how people think that they've got the power that they can actually, that they're allowed to behave in that way. And um, because maybe depending on their family, the families that they're from, they've been given that authority to act, thinking that they've got that authority to behave in that way. And um, depending on your partner and the type of partner you have, I think from my perspective, I'm in my 50s, so I'm not as young as what you all are. And, um, you know, being Asian, being married, and I think there can be a lot of there, a lot within that, um, with regards to how your relationship can be with your partner and language. So there might be specific language that your partner uses, and you could have the other partner just sort of sitting back and not responding but it actually really starting to affect them in building up and building up. And it's what do you do about that build up? How do you deal with that build up um, in making sure that you're stopping yourself from doing that? I think from that perspective, I'm just thinking about an Asian household and what it tends to be like. Um, I don't want to be specific and say an Asian household, but I just think um, when you're within a, a large family and you've got people there, you know, you can have a stronger partner and a weaker partner. And I think it's the weaker partner that can actually crumble themselves and what they can do to actually help them to get help and realize that, you know, you can get help there. You don't need to keep it in. Actually talk about it. Don't, just don't keep that in. I just think that's really important. I think I've gone off track again. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so I just, I do think language is a big part in relationships. And, um, and I think everyone should realize that and take a, back, a step back, like you said, Manoj, and actually realize I shouldn't use those words because it does affect a person. I've also, I also see my husband sometimes and he used to say a lot, man up. And I actually had to stop him from saying that because I think I met you once when I met you first time and you said you hated that word when someone says man up because it's actually quite a derogatory word if a person's actually very sensitive. And I took that back and actually um, when I would hear my husband saying it, I actually would sort of um, pull him back on it and actually say no refrain from saying that. Originally, you, you know, they used to joke about it, but I think it's an age group as well, the different type of ages and how people talk and how they relate I think that can that can be a um, not that they're even realizing that they might be doing something to a person um, by saying particular language but I think that um, they should be there should be realization of what you're actually saying and what type of language language you're actually using and not having an excuse I, mean, I didn't realize that I was doing that it's like taking a step back and think before you actually say something. And, and I think that's, that's definitely a place to get to when someone had, there needs to be some kind of disruption for that awareness to even come into play because it could totally be an unconscious pattern that a person is going through it and another person's at the effect of, or it could be vice versa as well. And it could be a very sustained thing, but the person that the receiving end of it doesn't think of it as well. Yeah. Um, I just shared on the Facebook Live that abuse can be anything from physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological, and can range from, from threats, manipulation, to actual physical harm, intimidation as well. So how does all this start? How does one, um, uh, how, does, how does this pattern begin? Where does it really stem from? So I know you, you mentioned, um, you know, culturally where there may be a patriarchy involved, that may also come in in terms of that set stereotype roles and you do this I do this I've got more on my plate than you have you need to serve me vice versa whatever way um but I think it's very whilst that is a factor I think we see it play out across the world so where how does he how do these patterns even even start off I think that they're learned coping mechanisms I think especially you know like, like you mentioned you know growing up with patriarchal values in, in certain cultures kind of reinforces the idea that you know people or sometimes men aren't held accountable for their behavior like you know old boys will be boys kind of thing especially like in the older generations and like even now I think 
obviously abuse comes from wanting to have control and sort of being you know being angry but underneath that anger there's like pain and sadness and I think because you know men aren't sort of socialized to communicate their emotions and feelings and there's that whole kind of you know belief around like toxic toxic masculinity where like oh you can't show your emotions and you have to like you can't be sensitive like you have to you know that's why phrases like man up come from it, then those feelings have to you know they're essentially being stifled and then they just sort of come out in the wrong way it's re it's really interesting isn't it because um <laughs> Uh, you know the back to your question which is like the six million dollar question right <laughs> like where does it all come from like it comes from many many ways and 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 different types and environments whether it's um parental um downstream of a pattern that just keeps keeps being recycled from parent to child to child then being the parent to then that child which is obviously a dangerous cycle because it will keep 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 growing until it takes someone and we covered this in the previous conversation with the men until it takes someone to actually break that cycle and it does need to be broken because it's it, it's it's very toxic right and and and, and it's and, and it's and, and and it's really deeply ingrained or, or whether it's basically within um, a friend circle or whether it's with your partner boyfriend girlfriend etc or within you know family and, and and I think the best thing I guess that we can do is raise awareness so so then people feel a level of comfort to even talk about it because this is a really tough subject to talk about for some people who are in that aspect right whether you're the abuser or whether you don't think you're the abuser, but you might be the abuser. That, that's that's another big question, right? You might not even realize that you're the abuser, but you actually might be. So that's an introspective question for everyone to kind of um, um, think about. Um, and when, when I say that, I'm not talking about sexual abuse necessarily or physical abuse, because that's sometimes a connotation we have with um, domestic abuse, but verbal abuse, right? Um, or having control as a um, um, I, th I think Anisha mentioned, so you can have narcissistic behavior or control mechanisms and, and being the aggressor. So it, it's fascinating, but but I guess the, it, it can be surfaced and re-triggered from different ways. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. But, but I think parental cycle is a big one to, I think, call out and break because that's dangerous, right? That's ingrained in generations. Um, yeah, I, I would add to that as well with... Um like childhood um when you're really young um especially I don't I don't know nowadays if anyone's teaching this anymore but I would remember like oh if a boy pulls your hair it means he likes you or something like that and it's like kind of perpetuating that idea that it's like some sort of weird playfulness to be um like aggressive or like treat someone mean wow. um and you get used to that and it's like ingrained in you so you just think like that's normal or like arguing with someone it's just a normal part of a relationship when really like it's just built on this um weird societal idea for probably from like stems from like patriarchal ideology um that's just like moved through the years mm. that's a great example of where it can be subtle and childlike but then that child is amplifying that to be, oh, it's, it's, it's now normal. And then blurring the lines between what was playful to then what is actually domestic abuse, right? It's that, that's a powerful, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's definitely a powerful one. Um, so then I guess it's raising awareness, it's breaking the cycle, but it's also re-educating people, right? At, at grassroots level as well. So, so, so from, like you said, uh, I don't know what they <laughs> what, I don't know what 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 they teach. My kids don't really share with me what they learn anymore in school. I've got a sixteen year old and a thirteen year old, but um, you'd like to think uh, that they're sharing something that is breaking down those uh, psychological barriers of language and what is accepted and what is not. And, and I know there's lots of talk about mindfulness um, all of a sudden in the last few years, right? But it's always been there. But but it's fascinating how it's just been surfaced because of key celebrities and influencers of talking about it and writing books and podcasts and movies etc but I think that's a powerful one I'd love to uh, hear from anyone I'm not sure if they're in education or, or from teachers or, or, or yeah because that, that, that for me is a, you just hit, hit a note I think you know, what, what does happen in school like what do they teach them at a young age definitely um, I, I don't invite anyone 
watching that's in education to, to definitely share that in the chat as well. Uh, Khadija, over to you. Yeah, I was going to say, I have a 10 year old brother, so I can kind of grasp how my education was totally different to his because they've started to acknowledge that, oh, wait, children have something called a mind and that mind can be impacted. Um, and so, you know, again, it's that kind of mainstream language of mindfulness has, you know, come up now and mental health is slowly becoming a discussion. Um, I've got cousins in secondary school who say that, yes, mental health is a discussion, but teachers don't actually do anything about it. It's only being like taught, but not really. I don't think they're actually um, exercising, trying to understand what the kids are actually going through or, um, yeah, bringing like that kind of topic to light. But um, the, one of the things that really came to mind when everyone was speaking was um, the language thing, even domestic abuse and abuse. I don't think that those terms are even discussed in the South Asian community specifically, but also like in, in wider society, I feel like it's kind of just quiet. Like it's really quiet. I think domestic abuse is a really quiet subject. And unless you're working in a field in mental health or something, you don't really come across the term. Um, and it's that thing where domestic is, is personal space, it's in the house. So I think a lot of people don't address domestic abuse because it's such a personal thing. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what comes to mind. Could I just say something? Yes, please. Um, so what I wanted to say was what, um, you know, talking about learning and we need to learn in schools, but actually it's what they learn at home mm. because they see that majority of the time so it's that cycle that needs to break. And yes, the schools need to. But then if you read in the papers, I think it was a couple of months ago about the private schools and how sexual um, incidences were happening and how rape were happening and whatever, but the schools never done anything about it. So they must have had some idea about it, but they'd hidden it. And that was a big thing that came out in the papers um, over a few months ago. So it's a child doesn't pick that up from, I don't know how they pick that up, you know, the fact that that is right to actually do that. Um, that in itself is abuse, but it does make you realize that the actual cycle needs to be broken from home. It's not, yes, school can actually talk about what's right and what's wrong, but that, that child can go back home and still see that happening um, in its, the strength that can, as you said, Manoj earlier, was basically like to break that cycle. You have to break it from the root. And that's the important bit that should actually happen. And actually um, for everyone not to accept it. And that would be, um, that was a, it's a tough thing for the, for the person that's being abused to actually break that cycle because they might love that person still but they want to help them, but they don't even know how to help them. You know, and it's, that would be very difficult, I think. I mean, that was an example, right, Viraj, that one of the guys shared uh, in, in the previous private Zoom chat about uh, describing that exact situation um, um, that that mother's explaining and, and being in that situation and then wanting to help uh, uh, from, from a loving way, but not knowing how to help and also, the challenge that we discussed earlier was that you might have the intention to help but how do you know the receiver is going to receive it in that way as well and then and then, then it's almost like a, oh my god what do i do like you know do, do i not help do i help and it's like agonizing um and and if i do help how do i reach reach out um i mean in that situation it, it was a mother and son relationship um, um but but it's tough right because of the, the mother's like you know um uh, nurturing and, and and doesn't really want the son to, to necessarily say or share or even feel those things or and then it goes to a cycle of it becomes normal which is scary which is even scarier because it's like it's happening so long it's happening for so long so many days so many weeks so many months that it's normal now and if somebody calls it out they almost get the shock that you're wrong what are you talking about this is normal which is even mind-blowingly scary right to think about that, that that it's someone a victim would feel that it's so normal because it's been happening repeated for so long so it does 100 percent need to be called out and, and I, I can't remember who shared who, who mentioned it um, um that it's not talked about in, especially in in south asian um, cultures and we need to 
absolutely shout from the rooftops about this subject because it, it, it just can't continue, right? It just can't continue. And it's not just our uh, South Asian culture, it's all cultures, all societies, right? Um, but but it just needs to be called out. And, and, and you're right, I can't remember you said it, it's a very quiet subject. It's a very quiet, like understated subject that gets approached with a level of sensitivity because um, I think, uh, I think I think maybe Khadija said that um, because it's domestic, but it's inside. It's your personal space. But actually, actually, how can you? And we talked about right, Viraj. How can you be silent to violence? So, 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 do you not do anything? And and if you're silent, then are you a co-conspirator in that act by not doing something? It's it's that line between I don't want to rock the boat, but then when something happens, you feel guilty. So where is that middle ground of like, uh, and how do you how do you intervene? Um, Mother, over to you. I just wanted to say, um, basically, we're so used to hearing the fact that it's shame on the family, on the family name, and it could be that reason why people don't they keep it behind closed doors. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and. And Ramesh has commented here in the chat that this is one of the most unreported crimes. And um, and I think that, and just some context as well, just in terms of stats. So this is according to a, a survey by, by Mankind. A um, few key things stood out is that male victims have, are more likely to consider taking their life um, due to partner abuse. And um, there's been an increase. And so nearly half of all men will fail to tell if they're at the effect of abuse and three times less likely to tell anyone other than a female victim, which is increased from the same survey that was done um, four years ago. So at, in that survey, two thirds of men would say that if they were at the effect of some kind of abuse, they would speak out about it. It's now shift to half, half of them won't. So there's definitely, um, uh, there's definitely there's that element of shame, whether that's a cultural context and even within genders as well, I feel that some it, it certainly the statistics indicate that men are less likely to talk about it um, or, or deal with it or more likely to, to see suicide as a potential way out of it as well. Um, great comment here from Nimesh in, in, in the chat here as well is that evil prevails when good men do nothing. The question is, when do you see when you see or identify abuse, how should you deal with this? I think that that's a great one to just kind of open up with. I know there's various different support channels as well, but what would be something I would say personally that we would do if we saw someone that's a friend or someone that we're close to and we get some kind of inkling that there's something going on how would we or what could be best practices to approach that conversation it would be to talk to them really to try and talk to them where you know that they are willing to listen it's very sense it's a very sensitive subject because they may Mm -hmm. not be seeing it and we would be seeing it as an outsider and it's how we w- it would be to actually just be there for them and them knowing that you are there for them. But it's the fact that they the abuser has to accept it, that they you know that they want help. If they don't want help, what do we do? If they don't want help, um, it's just them knowing that. Where then you might have opened that um, open um, opened your arms to them or you know your ears to them for them to realize that actually maybe if they're not seeing it for them to actually then start realizing that they, oh, this may not be right, you know, um, is actually for them, it might open their eyes in that sense and start realizing, okay, people are telling me this, um, this may be happening. So maybe it's just for them to open them, it'll open their eyes for them to realize. But I, for me personally, I would say if I knew that someone was, I would, um, it would be doing that approach first and asking them if they needed help rather than just sort of diving in there and saying, oh, this is what I'm seeing. It's more, are you okay? Um, yeah. Is there anything that can help you with? That's what personally I would do. And then start working with them very slowly if they're open to that. Yeah, I think you've hit a great point because you don't want to back someone into a corner where they become defensive potentially about it, which will just shut them down even more. So at least handling that initial touch point conversation with some some sensibility um sen- sensibility sensitivity and get my tongue in a twist um got a comment here on that from from Sonam in the chat as well a very valid point the shame angle is so is used in so many in so many things but most of all with abuse admitting that something is wrong is seen as a failure and it breeds into shame 
I hope that we can become a more open community and thriving in other ways uh, and move beyond this. So 100% agree with that there, Solon, as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, Khadija, Nadia, Anisha, like, would love your perspectives on, on how to potentially bridge or introduce this conversation to, to what may be a potential abuser or a potential victim too. I think, um, yeah, so, oh, sorry, Anisha. No, go on, you um, go. Thanks. So um, just to, to lead on from that, I mean, I've had experiences with friends where it's gone the complete like wrong way where I, I pushed them too hard and I end up losing them as a friend and they they don't get any they, they just stay in that relationship because um, they refuse to see it because you push them so hard. Um, whereas I think the be better way to, to do it after learning is to just be there as um, support and also validate their feelings because a lot of abuse comes from like gaslighting. So they always blame themselves for things going wrong or they're like, oh, but you know, like they do this for me. So maybe I am being unfair. And it's just about validating their feelings and making making them realize that they, can, they, are, they are like strong-minded and they don't need to doubt themselves. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing to highlight with um, a potential abuser is that they will be able to like manipulate your thoughts. So it's about making sure that making the person feel reassured in themselves. So um, whenever a friend says something and it seems like they've like doubting their feelings, it's just you just validate it. You just be like, no, I think I'd, I'd feel the same, exact same. And it's normalizing whatever their experiences are. So they feel sure of themselves that they're not they're not like overthinking something yeah i'd say to kind of like follow on from that i think a big part of it is you know you're kind of as a child if you're you know in an environment where you're not able to disagree or voice your opinion or, or you know if you're in pain you're not able to express that you then aren't able to set boundaries you end up people pleasing and then you fall into these patterns where you're not because you're not able to validate yourself you're looking for it from other people um, and then that can make it quite difficult to get trapped into in, in a relationship where you then end up you know, serving the other person before yourself um, and I think approaching like these kind of things is like without judgment um, and just like with compassion whether it's like the abuser or the person who's suffering from the abuse is probably like the key thing because you'll just overwhelm them otherwise if you end up kind of coming across as if you're like attacking them or judging them they won't want to open up and they won't actually be able to you know try and th there'll be no like kind of curiosity as to like or why are they reacting that way why are they hurting that person or, or, or tolerating that hurt so I think it has to kind of come from like a gentle like a gentle approach yeah because I suppose ironically you don't want to position yourself as the rescuer when there's a potential victim persecutor at play as well so it's just be mindful of of that dynamic that you're not trying to swoop in and save someone but as you say with curiosity and 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 that gentle touch just to check in with what what what's going on here is everything okay and hear someone out for them to feel like just that they're being heard and they're not second guessing themselves so i think that self-realization is, is probably more powerful than someone telling you that this is wrong and you need to leave this person or get out of this situation um and and just um what's the word i'm looking for just kind of fostering that connection and that that open communication um i've just shared a comment here in the from the chat from from yuvraj which i think is a, a, another great way to look at this is could moral policing be regarded as an abuse and what what i'm getting from that is i suppose someone directing you what you should or shouldn't think what you what you should or shouldn't do to that extent where if, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're Rajan, that's, that's what you're mentioning there. So I think definitely, I mean, when you're trying to control someone's thoughts in that sense and, and potentially gaslighting comes into that play, you're ju you, you almost become like a, a bit of a puppet master. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's what's the intention behind it? Like, what is your intention? I always like to start with what's your intention behind it? And are you there to control? Then obviously it's you're not you're not you're not adding any value. Um, are, are you there to guide, signpost, um, and gently, subtly, as, as Nadia has put it? Because you've got to be really careful, right? Because of the, the example that you gave that you know you you've lost that friend or that friend circle, etc. Um, so you you definitely can't stay silent for sure. 
but it's having the subtlety of knowing your audience and how they're going to receive that message um, in the right way, right? Um, um, going in sort of gung-ho is not going to kind of um, nine times out of 10 help because they'll get really, really defensive and then they'll blame you. Um, even though you might have had the intention, but your delivery behind it uh, was flawed, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Madhu, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the thing is, if they're, say, being controlled and all of a sudden we're going in there and sort of talking to them in that manner, they're going to go into a corner. So it is definitely just getting that balance right and being, being there for them. And, and I know because I've seen relationships and I would literally blow up thinking, no, that's not right or whatever. But I'd be saying that behind closed doors, but maybe it's with my girls or whatever. But it's literally, actually, I have to, t I have to stay calm in making sure that they know that I'm just there for them to actually help them rather than sort of trying to control them when they're already being controlled in a relationship it's not what they it's not what they want you just need to have that softer approach definitely um yep. yeah just just thinking actually there's an interesting one um what do you love to get your perspective everyone what do you think are some of the signs of domestics obviously some are obvious um but some are not so obvious right so so what, what would you think are some of the signs of domestic abuse i would say isolation and withdrawal Okay. Yeah, I think that's a that's a big one. We were um, we were sharing in, in in the men's meeting we had about um, how we in the past or we've noticed certain friends that are in relationships, and the word we use oh they're so under the fun they get the call and off they go, and actually looking back on that we're like was well, something going on there so just just in those scenarios of like observing those patterns of behavior if someone radically changes their behavior, which could then lead to kind of isolation or in the example that we shared like the person was just having to check in with their partner can they go out to see their mates or can they like that kind of stuff and you kind of and maybe this kind of tips into the, to the banter piece but you kind of joke about it and say oh yeah they're under the thumb they're done it's like well now that you take a step back and look at that it's like something else going on there yeah um and to add on to that so it's like like not just a change in just behavior, but maybe like mindset or just their mental health. They might seem to have a lower self-esteem or less confident in, in themselves. Then you, um, some some sort of temperaments like that can kind of be a sign that something else is impacting them or someone's affected them quite deeply. Any any other signs from Manisha? Go on. I think also like general kind of like signs and symptoms of like anxiety and depression really you know that can like mm -hmm. manifest into things like poor eating poor sleeping not able to do like your day-to-day and -day, not able to like kind of you know go to work and things like that it can just kind of manifest in like a range of ways that can just affect your general well-being even self-doubt if someone's always self-doubting them that could be a sign mm. that something's not right that was a we'll, we'll cover that in it. That was a big one that we talked about as well um, in in, in um, the previous talk, wasn't it, Viraj, about um, negative self talk and self doubt and um, lowering your own self esteem, which is yeah. e equally very dangerous as well. Um, yeah. Khadija, have you got any um, anything to add on like some of the signs? Um, so I actually attended a safeguarding training because I work with Mind. And um, it was for uh, domestic abuse uh, in adults. And um, like some of the signs were unexplained injuries, um, change in their finances, things like that. But there was this particular like uh, 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 PowerPoint slide and I can't find it right now, but a lot of the things that was mentioned just made me think about people in my family. And I never ever thought that there were certain like simple things that count as domestic abuse or um, can lead to like further kind of worse abuse. Um, I'm going to try and find that document because I think it's really important. But um, yeah, it, I can't even remember what was on it right now. But there were certain things on it that like, for example, the controlling finances. Um, I know a lot of South Asian women who don't work and the ones that do work 
their finances are still controlled by their husbands. Um, there's a lot of kind of uh, like the, the controlling money and the finances in the house and the kind of gender norm of the man has to control the money um, that still exists, even if a woman is working. Um, like something like that I saw. And I, yeah, it just yeah, made me really think about kind of my own happiness. Yeah. It's quite eye-opening, isn't it? The subtleties of where the signs can come from. Um, and I think for me, um, it's it's a shift or change in personalities because sometimes we wear, we wear these masks, don't we, um, in, in public? Um, and um, yeah, it's just like, like I would always look out for a subtle change in someone's uh, personality and I wouldn't necessarily relate it to a it's almost like breadcrumbs, right? It might, it might be a mood swing, but then what's the next step after that mood swing? What was the catalyst and the, what caused that mood swing? And then, and if we follow sort of the breadcrumbs subtly, um, unfortunately, um, in many cases, it does lead to domestic abuse. Um, but the signs can be so subtle sometimes um, that, that you won't see it. Um, so so I, I, I like to kind of look out for change in personalities and in people who are close um, around me. And that's always a, always a, 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 a big telltale sign. Also like, relating to the, the self-doubt, I think if someone's experiencing like, a lot of domestic abuse, they're constantly feeling threatened and very hypervigilant. So they're not able to rationalize even when it's like to do with things that aren't related to their partner or abuse. So even their general decision-making, they're unable to do that because they're constantly feeling threatened and yeah like they just they, they doubt themselves a lot so I think that they then you know they have less independence and less confidence and they're constantly relying on that person to make all these decisions for them so there's like that kind of element of codependence there that's stemming from a kind of like a poor relationship with themselves and low self-worth because they're kind of stuck in this like vicious cycle. It'd be great to unpack that a bit more because that self-doubt uh, one of the guys in, 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 in the group actually put a question saying, um, and we were talking the whole range spectrum of domestic abuse, and he said, how about this? Is this, is this abuse? And he said, what about self-abuse? Of course, right? It's, that, 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 that's a form of um, um, abuse. Um, and self-abuse can be physical. It can be uh, emotionally negative language being told to yourself repeatedly after pattern after pattern and then that's almost a dangerous thing and we, we were just um, um, trying to unpack some of the tools um, that we've used ourselves where we've found ourselves in the, those situations at whatever times and um, like meditation or positive affirmations but repeating it before I think you said it right Viraj um, um, it, before you go to sleep and when you wake up the first thing in the morning and not letting what happens in the day kind of because you can't control to some degree right, everything what happens in a day but you can control what you say to yourself when you first wake up and you can control what you say to yourself when you last go to sleep and that's when the mind becomes almost free or starts to become free because you get it's like you're taking a deep breath and you, and you have space and, and you're giving yourself that that, that mental space and I think it's really, I mean, I do it every, every morning and every night. Um, so that's, I can talk about it, but it's really, it's, it's really subtle. It's free, but it's so powerful and profound. And I think if you do it long enough, it becomes like brushing your teeth. You just wake up, you do it, you go to sleep, you do it. And, 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 and that way you're guarding your own environment and you're protecting your mind um, from all the noise around you. And I think that's, I don't know, it's just it's simple, but powerful. Method. I've read that um, in a book about the subconscious mind and kind of how what you consciously think is consumed by your subconscious mind. So that's why just before you sleep, if you're thinking good things about yourself, you're kind of manifesting it into your subconscious yeah. mind and then it becomes your reality the next day or, you know, general life. But yeah. You're Definitely. just stacking good stuff, basically, for sure. Um, we're just getting close to time, so I definitely want to move ahead in terms of like sharing some ways that you know people can receive support on um, and awareness on, on how they can leverage that support. Um, just in the last few days, I'm just sharing this on the Facebook Live, there was a documentary that came out on the BBC by Ian Wright where he talks about um, growing up um, in childhood abuse and explores the traumas that that has as well. So I think that's a great resource for, for a lot of people to, to look into um, and, and one that we, you know, I've heard amazing things about and I can't wait to, to, to look at myself. Um, but just opening it up to everyone, what are what are ways that people can 
can come into contact with with you know either reroute mental health or, or other avenues of support so that they could even begin to just start having this conversation or, or feel empowered to to make a decision on, on what to do if they're in such a situation. Um, I want to go to Madhu first. I'm just going to go across the, the order of my screen. Thanks. I mean, basically what we would do is um, sort of, if people contact us, they're more than, they can contact us via email or through Facebook. The top of my head, I can't, buy, I can't remember the email address, but um, I'll try and get that and then put it on the screen. Um, but basically emailing us, contacting us, and we would definitely get in touch with them. And we would sort of provide them with support, just being that listening ear. We're not all professionals on there. It's more of us where we would direct them to um, the organizations where they can actually get support. And I used to work in a pharmacist and I know there was one where it's ask for Annie when you go into a pharmacy it's a code word scheme that they've actually done, but it's not all, I don't know, I'm not too sure if all pharmacists do that, but if someone goes in there and actually says, you know, um, Annie, it stands for action needed immediately. So the pharmacist actually becomes aware that they need support, they would actually say contact someone. So there's definitely, that's, um, that's actually a good one, I think, because if someone's just popping into a pharmacy and they're not with a a partner or their abuser or whatever it's actually quite good for them to know that they can that there is that at hand um, but I would say to actually contact us and we would support them be a listening ear and we would direct them as to which organizations they could actually go to there's quite a few on on site there but under gov.uk you'll actually find it under there the actual um domestic abuse help that you can actually get. And then there's um, Women's Aid as well, and um, Refuge, where they do actually support. But yeah, that's what I would, we, we'd actually definitely get in touch with them. And we'd always be, that is, that is the whole point of mental wealth, is to be there for women and to support women. I know it's it was a mixed uh, group about a year and a half ago, but then that obviously um, all changed. So um, yes, just to get through us in that way, but I'm going to try and get it up and then I'll write the email address and everything for people to contact us on. Amazing. And, and I've shared the, the gov.uk um, in, in the yeah. Facebook chat, is that the link for refuge is going in there soon and we'll definitely share the email address as well. Um, Nadia, over to you. Um, yeah, so um, similar to mental wealth as um, Reroute, we, we're a support group for women um, and we, we, as a community, we are definitely big on just supporting mental health in whatever way. So if you find our Facebook page or our Instagram, we're always promoting ways of like building your confidence and your self-esteem. And we share so many materials and we have a lot of um, so support group and um, meetings like monthly um, discussing different topics. And I just think in that way um, for women, it's really empowering and that can be the, the first thing to get you going for kind of building the confidence to to be aware of uh, whether you're in an abusive relationship or just dealing with any trauma that um, you may have taken away from a past relationship um, and also we um, can signpost you to um, loads of organizations as uh, mentioned already like women's aid and refuge um, and also just um, as uh, Khadija mentioned, MIND, um, which is a really supportive organization for just mental health in general. So there are, you don't have to go to anywhere specifically for whatever you're dealing with. There's just, there's so, so many systems and support groups out there. Um, so if anyone did really need any support, then they, they should reach out and speak up. Uh, Khadija, over to you. Any any ones that you'd like to add? Um, I'm not really sure what else to add, but kind of yeah. Like what is quite amazing about Reroot is that um, I never knew it existed. So I live in East London, and I couldn't find any culturally tailored support for South Asians. Um, I'm still searching, um, and um, yeah. So Reroot is kind of based in Harrow, and I guess one positive thing that's come out of the pandemic is I've been able to kind of help facilitate the workshops on Zoom 
Um, and I think that, uh, so I've got like some of my friends and family members to join the support group and it's all confidential. And it's just amazing to be able to even have the space to discuss things that maybe you're unable to talk about at home. Um, so, and like, there's things that maybe you might not want to say, but someone else in the group will say, and then you realize that you're kind of not alone. So I think that's what's kind of amazing about our um, workshops. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to try to continue doing that monthly. And I know that everyone's kind of enjoying the freedom to move around again. But hopefully we could, um, yeah, hopefully people will join. Amazing. And Anisha, over to you. Um, yeah, I don't really have much, much else to add. I think kind of I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I think even though the sessions like are on Zoom, it's still really interactive and we kind of make sure that everyone has a chance to say as much or as little as possible. Um, and the topics differ each month. Um, and it just creates like a safe space, um, a confidential one that people can kind of just share whatever they're feeling um, and what their thoughts are on whatever subject we're talking about. So um, yeah, I'd encourage anyone to kind of like to, to join and try it out because I think it's like it's, it's, it's just kind of normalizing, you know, the fact that everyone suffers with mental health issues and kind of just kind of to highlight it and make sure that there's everyone's getting the support that they need. Amazing. And, and Manoj, any, any other resources, obviously other than Mindful Men's Club for, for us as well that you'd like to, to add? Yeah, I think obviously um, um, great um, resources um, by the women that, sh you know, shared it for, for the women. And I think for the men, it's, it's, it's really um, the space that we've created, right, with Haban, um, Sagar, Viraj and myself and having that freedom of speech because it is really free speech right it's always free flowing every two weeks on a saturday so um, i'd call out to all men if, if you're if you're on the receiving end or if you're even a, a abuser um or if you're uh, the hero right the saver if you like um it doesn't really matter just uh, reach out to us um you can reach out to us on youtube reach out to us on insta our facebook page etc um and yeah definitely reach out i think just something i just wanted to share that and i shared it in, in the previous chat and, I think you were saying something. I can't remember what you were actually saying, but there's so much stuff going on there. And I just had this like realization, um, a re reflection, and I'll just share it. And and it just hit me and like, okay, I have to write it down now. So um, I think for me, the essence of mindfulness is being mindful, mindful of when your mind is actually full, right? So so the answers are all in the words itself. And I think it relates to what I said um about the daily practice of in the morning and in the evening that you can't be you can't create mindfulness if you don't start to empty what's already in your mind right and 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 and, and create that free space and i think a simple um just just a simple technique would be um is to practice that because you you're the keeper of that space it's so private and no one can touch it so when you wake up in the morning when you go to sleep in the night um, say something nice about yourself, um, so, you know, to say a positive affirmation. And when you live it, breathe it and feel it, it will be part of who you are. And, and it will echo everywhere around and people will go off that vibe. But yeah, just wanted to share that. And yourself. Yeah, uh, no, I, I love that. Yeah, no, I, I love that analogy when you shared that. Um, and I've, I've just shared on the Facebook group, um, on the chat, the, the link for Mankind, which is a, a male charity for domestic abuse victims as well. Um, I mean, I, I think there's so much. I, I this was once so this particular topic was brought to us by a, a member of the mindful men's club that couldn't actually end up making the meeting anyway so we just thought well let's just roll with it and i think i've learned so much um just through reflection and, and hearing from from other people and, and obviously um connecting with you on this facebook live um just as we wrap up i think what are the key takeaways reflections um and i'm going to invite everyone to to share that um i think for me was one of the suggestions that um, one of the lads had in the men's meeting of creating that safe time. So if you're in a, a relationship with someone to just say whatever there is in a totally neutral environment, just to get it off your chest, because sometimes those suppressed feelings can manifest into some kind of form of an abuse because you're just not dealing with it yourself. And that could have a knock-on effect, whether you end up self-harming or to the other extreme, physically harming. So just having that kind of, here's what I'm dealing with, here's what you're dealing with, and just having that safe space where there's no judgment, just to kind of dump those feelings and then step back into life now that you've created that vent for yourself as well to potentially prevent uh, any any kind of pattern of abuse beginning to, to happen there. 
Um, and again, just just invite everyone. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order now. So Khadija, over to you. Um, what's your takeaway um, or or key thing you'd like to pass on? Um, I think to kind of I feel like everyone needs to be a bit more brave. And just kind of like stop talking, just literally just let it out. Um, I feel like maybe someone that you can trust, you know that you can trust, like slowly start to speak to them about things that maybe you find difficult to speak about. I think as soon as you start opening dialogue, it becomes a lot easier to discuss um, just, yeah, a lot of things that you may be going through. Um, personally, I think even kind of going out my way to find groups and support groups that um, speak about mental health and mental well-being and about culture and the impacts it has on mental health has really helped me to like discuss my own mental health a lot easier with people and I'm a lot more open about it um, so I think yeah just kind of going out your way to do your research for what might be best for you I think you will end up in the right place uh, but yeah that's my take. Awesome. Uh, Anisha? Um, I'd say if you're kind of, if you're like a third party and you're trying to, you know, you're worried that someone is experiencing abuse or is the abuser and you kind of, you know, you sense a shift in like their behaviour, then just try and check in. Um, even if you're, even if there's nothing actually going on, I think it's always like important to try and just, you know, make them aware that you're there um, to support them and that you're, you're there to listen um, if they need someone to talk to. I think if, that person is, you know, in, in, in a relationship where they feel that they're, they're being abused. I think trying to like approach it from the mindset of, oh, your actions, this is how it makes me feel, as opposed to being like, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. I think it's trying to shift the focus on how that's impacting you and your feelings um, might help. Great stuff. Uh, Nadia? Um, yeah, so adding on to that, like what I said before uh, about if you are um, worried about a friend, um, just ensuring that you're like validating whatever they feel and that that's probably the best way to support them is validate them and normalize them and, and empathize with them and make, make sure that they feel they've got that support and they've got someone on their side that's, that's fighting for them and rooting for them. And then on top of that, to like, we need to reduce this shame around, um, relationships and also like mental health like the ending of a relationship it's a, such a big thing in um certain cultures that like you can't leave a relationship you're you should stay and fight because that's that's just what you do like people leave relationships too easily where that shouldn't be the case um and it's just feeling more empowered and independent to be able to to at least try and walk away and like speak up about it and also the shame around mental health, because if there's this stigma around speaking about your emotions and not being able to talk about um, how you're feeling, then you're going to keep quiet both to your partner and to everyone else. So there's just the general idea of like being ashamed. We need to we need to stop that and reduce that stigma. Yeah, love that. Love that. Uh, Manoj. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think everyone's echoed it so nicely. I think for me, it's just as simple as uh, start with yourself. So have a beautiful conversation with yourself first, because that you're elevating your own mindset and you're, you, you know, uh, practicing mindfulness. And then also, sometimes it's not the obvious one. So what I mean by that is connect with whoever you feel is right to connect to and whichever organization is right to connect to. And it's not always the family and friends. And sometimes the best conversations are with somebody who has no bias opinion of you and who hasn't been brought up with you and is not in a relationship with you etc and, and they can actually see life through a very um, unfiltered lens and and, and, and and maybe give you that support that you need so I guess reach out to whoever you feel comfortable with but definitely reach out don't suppress it um, for sure because there's so much help um, and so many people willing to help you you just have to kind of have the courage which takes takes a lot of courage to, to even talk about it and, and, and just sort of um yeah, I guess reach out to whoever you feel um, um, uh, comfortable with and, and, and don't be silent is, is, is my, my takeaway. Yeah. And finally, over to you, Madhu. I was just going to say that, Manoj, <laughs> is to actually um, don't stay silent, break that taboo and go out and get help. And, you know, sometimes 
basically it was literally what my lord was going to say is basically that you know um go out and get help even if it's from someone that you don't know because it's easier to talk to someone that you don't know and you'd actually probably start being able to think clearly in that way because you're not talking to someone who's biased or um you know or someone who knows your partner or your child or whatever um it's I would say go out just don't say style don't don't say silent don't say silent go out and get help and talk about it because it's not right and try and notice the signs if you're noticing signs and you know um be aware of those signs and um yeah definitely don't say silent I would say Absolutely. And, and just inviting everyone that's watching us on the live to, to share this video with people that you feel that it may be useful for. Um, the links that we've shared in the chat as well in terms of resources. And, and do, don't feel afraid to, to reach out to, to any one of us um, and we can definitely help support and, and provide some guidance there on work as well. So thank you everyone for the amazing questions and the comments in the chat. We'll, we'll catch up with a few that we weren't able to get to. Um, and again, thank you everyone on, on this live here with me, Manoj Madhu. Nadia, Khadija, Anisha for, for holding this space and creating this beautiful conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye.